Good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for episode number 55. And along the 55, I thought, how long has it been since we've actually had a speed limit that was 55? I thought we'd do Roadmap to Fractional Services is what the title of our program is today. And I'm Brendan Filbert, Managing Partner of SalesWorks. And my job all day, every day, is helping people find and secure their next opportunity whether that be a perfect client for their business or exploring fractional work or securing a gig or 1099 opportunity. So that's kind of the the perspective that I bring. And I am so excited to introduce one of my favorite clients, referral partners and resources, Mark Blockton, that is, I mean, he is in, not only has he been there, done that, got the t-shirt, He has the entire wardrobe along fractional services. And I thought it would be a really fun conversation to have with Mark today. Mark, do you want to do a brief intro of who you are? Sure. Uh, Mark Blackton, obviously I'm with a a small consulting, fractional consulting group called uh, Insights 3. And we're here and in Michigan. That makes us sound really impressive. There's all six of us. Um, But uh, we have a great time. And uh, on my personal uh, runway, and what I love to do is help people understand the value of their business and do some transition planning. We're going to talk a little bit more about how you pick the topic later, but that's that's my hot spot and what I love to do. Fantastic. All right. So the perspective that we are going to take today is primarily an interview. And where I thought Mark could offer the most value is in hearing from a successful business leader that has executed this strategy and he did it prior to, during, and post-pandemic. So you have perspective from him on the avenues that have worked for him. And quite frankly, I love learning from those who have gone before me. So I can learn from the things that worked for them and the things that didn't work. And that's what our conversation is going to be around today. But where I'd like for you, where I'd like to kick things off is very quickly, if you all would do me a favor and use the questions pane and chat in whether you are currently offering fractional services. So just give me a yes or a no. And let's get a sense of how many of you are in startup or pre-startup with this versus people that are actually at revenue. So Mark, you've got the questions pane over there. I'm seeing it. Okay. I got a, I've got an oops there from Michael. I like that. There you go. I think I've muted everybody again, so we won't have any accidental background noise. The system works very well to actually mute people. <laughs> it just doesn't work as well to unmute people. Okay, so it looks like we're about 50-50. So we've got a couple of different perspectives that we'd like to share just as kind of the, as an opportunity as far as if this is something that makes sense for you. So I'm going to kick this off by asking Mark a question. And the biggest question is, should fractional services be considered as a last resort in terms of a career opportunity? Because I think so many people view it as if I can't land a, a, a day job or a nine to five, then at the very least, I might be able to hop over and do some fractional so I can keep the bills paid. And, and that's a great question. Um, uh, the reason that I that comes up, I think, is that people do use it as a last resort. You know, it takes longer and longer to find a job. Uh, if you're, you know, in the 150 to $200,000 range, you know, the, the rule of thumb is a month for every $10,000 in your salary. So people do get desperate. They go to consulting, they do whatever to make some money. And I think we want to try to dis- distinguish the difference between that last resort approach to fractional or consulting services and uh, making it a true career. Okay. So are you experiencing and have you seen the, um, the impact of ageism? in terms of trying to actually secure opportunities right now. And that's one thing that I've, that I've noticed a lot of in terms of the people that are most looking for opportunities right now seem to be that senior executive that probably did have a higher salary and may have been one of the first places cut. 
Exactly right. And there is ageism. There's no doubt about it. I mean, couldn't, wouldn't want, know how to support it in court, but you know, people are, as you get older, you get into the mid fifties and above, um, it's, it's harder to find a C-level job. Companies like to promote from within. And so it's very rare, unless you have a really specific skill set, uh, to be able to come in and get a C, C-level job uh, directly without experience in the company. So there's no question that it's harder to find a job as you get older. And, um, but on the other side, it, it, it's creating tremendous opportunity too, because what's happening and the reason that there is a demand for um, fractional work is that as people retire, there are huge gaps. And a lot of these younger people have not in, have not really experienced 40 years, well, they can't experience 40 years of, you know, right. of job. And they need some help. And they, they may not be able to justify a full-time person, but <clears throat> um, the fractional approach works for them. It's a big Absolutely. demand. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what we'd like to help you all understand today is where maybe this could be the first and best option. And I would actually, actually, I'd love to share just a really quick example, if I can, to kind of help you all understand how you might reposition your perspective on fractional work. So I was working with one of my clients that was a former VP of finance within an area hospital group. And he was actually younger. So he was in his probably mid-30s. But he was one of those very talented professionals that landed in a job and just demonstrated immense value and just kept getting promoted up higher and higher until he was eventually over 21 outpatient facilities. And he was working 80 and 100 hours a week with a very demanding job and had three young children. And he actually bailed from corporate in order to go pursue fractional work, specifically because he wanted to watch his kids grow up and be a part of their early years and not miss out on all that. So while we may think of fractional work as being something that is, I, I only want to explore this if I can't get this, being whatever the nine to five opportunity would look like, there are so many people right now, he has more than replaced his revenue and he's actually hiring professionals that are working under him to directly execute the work. And within that, he's making money off their services as well. So it's pretty exciting. So, all right, so let me just ask Mark, what are you seeing are the greatest opportunities right now for fractional work? Well, I think there's, you know, obviously the, the fractional CFO position is really, um, become prevalent and and you see a lot of that now and and I believe what's happening is people would have tried to box that and say well only financial services could be fractionalized and the truth of the matter is you know I'd, I'd ask everyone to look back in their career what did you have to learn that you and, and that you you solved a problem right and you know other companies have it and need that knowledge base right that's it I believe from marketing to information technology and management, you, you see quite a bit. These, there's a demand for all of them. And, and I see people doing it and doing quite well. And just to kind of give you some ideas, uh, we've, and even on our call today, we've got folks that are senior operators. We've got folks that have been senior sales. We've got accounting and finance. I have many clients that are um, their financial advisors and they actually are selling fractional services as your personal CFO. So there are so many different ways that you can re-envision your services and think of how you offer them on a fractional basis. And one of the things that I absolutely love, so just to kind of give you an example, I love sharing what other people have done one of our other clients was a um, she had been working in business development within a very large local engineering firm and her area of expertise that she absolutely loved was the response to rfps and focusing on that competitive bidding environment and she was amazing at it 
So she's created a fractional service around offering a response to RFP service. So if you have a small business and you want to pursue work with either large corporations, if you have a set aside, or if there are opportunities to respond to RFPs, then she could be a really good resource for you. And she sells that on a regular basis. So excuse me for just a second. Hang on, I've got something in the background. So Mark, could you go ahead and talk just a bit about how you got your start in offering fr fractional services? Yeah, I, I, I can do that. I, I think I've just always been more of a fractional service person, even when I worked within big companies. And I would always be a problem solver. So I really um, started in fractional services more in the last several years as a broker. I was brokering. And then as I realized what I really loved to do was do valuations and transitions, I have, I call it staying in my lane, right? I love to do business valuations and transitions. I could do and have done fractional CFO work but I, I choose to do what I really like to do, and I'll do that better. So I think everyone needs to try to do that. And what, I'll give you an example of what can happen in a financial uh, situation, uh, financial. You know, somebody comes in and they sell themselves as a fractional CFO. Mm -hmm. And then they wonder, um, you know, and then, and then they end up balancing the checkbook. Right? And they wonder why exactly. the client's not happy paying them $200 an hour. So you have to have resources to back you up, do what you really love to do and bill appropriately for the type of time, what the market value of that time is, and you're gonna be very successful. So let's talk about, I'm, I'm gonna chase this rabbit trail here if I can, yeah. Mark. Sure. So talk about how you determine what your hourly rate should be, or how did you pick your hourly rate? I picked my hourly rate by just polling the market and talking to other uh, financial service providers. And then I took uh, that number and I, I reduced it. And I reduced it not because I'm not worth it, but because I don't like to have to eat time. And I never feel guilty about rate charging the rate that I've come up with for my hours. So I think it, the market, market has to bear it. Has to you have to be able to demonstrate that it's worth that two hundred dollars an hour number uh, if you're doing that kind of work, and um, and get your you know get out there and do a couple of good jobs and people are going to find you. Well, and it's interesting, and this is one of the things that I've seen happen a lot. You and I both know professionals that have secured jobs where they were paid what was a fair rate for that position, and then it's a matter of maybe it got negotiated down for whatever reason because the business owner didn't quite have enough so they took a job with a little bit of a reduction or compromising on what their compensation was in order to get the company up to the point where they could afford to pay them their full rate only what seems to happen is they get hired, they go in and they fix all the problems for a reduced rate. And then the business owner says, oh, thanks, I'm good now. I'm gonna go hire somebody that I'm paying half of what I'm paying you to keep moving with everything that I've, that you did all the work building. building. Right. So right. That's, that's another reason that I see fractional services as being a first resort rather than a last resort. It, because it's it's a case of the market out there needs somebody that has so many companies to your point need that senior executive or that leader that's been there done that has a lot of experience and figuring out how to package that I think is something also that people struggle with so Absolutely. how how do you do that in terms of helping people recognize what engaging with you would look like Mark uh, that's a long process. <laughs> so so I, let's think, break it down. Let's yeah, break it I, down. I let's you. start no. with networking. Right. I do def I do a tremendous amount of networking. You know, I took Brendan's class six years ago now, I believe, and uh, I learned a tremendous amount about how to uh, be part of a networking uh, community. And that has served me very well. Um, uh, 
So yes, network is important. People need to know what you're doing. It's really yes. easy, right? I mean, my five minute or my 30 second commercial used to take about 55 minutes. Um, it's not a good plan. You know, my, now my, my response is what do I do? I, I, I do business valuations and help people transition their business and it's done and it's easy and I don't have to explain how it's done. If they're interested, they'll come and ask me more questions over and mm -hmm. over, no matter where you're at. So uh, the networking, being able to summarize what you do very quickly and um, help other people. And you and that's will huge. do really well. The, the emotional equity component is something that I think so many people miss out on. And in, when you're thinking about it, and I, I actually do want to talk about that for just a minute. So let's go back six years to when you didn't have a huge network and you were getting started. How did you build that reciprocal value with people so that they wanted to help you secure whatever that next opportunity was? Well, exactly. It's 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 basically giving without expecting uh, a, re a return and it's a weird way to look at life you know I help people find jobs I you know I help people find other service providers throughout the community uh, and I and I've slowly built that reputation where people will call me and because they know they'll help and of course you know I've had people call me from two years ago in the last few weeks that you know i never thought i'd ever get a job you know an opportunity or services lead or you know whatever and and all of a sudden they just show up right mm -hmm. because i remembered what i did and uh it's just really being consistent with with your network get out there um again start doing presentations town halls whatever to uh, promote yourself and and expand your market and uh there's just so many things that go from there. Well, and it's really interesting. So there was a really good question that just got asked about what percentage of time should you spend doing the work versus selling the work? And if you'd like, Mark, I can take a run at it and then you can kind of share your experience with this you as know, well. I want you to take a run at it, but I want to comment before. I've gotten to the point where I like, I like finding the work better than actually doing the work sometimes it's just becomes it's become quite a lot of fun so go ahead on the time uh, well and that's yeah. actually so what mark has done incredibly well and i do want to i want to um highlight one of i think the biggest questions that he answered when he built his practice is how would he scale and how would he grow because there are a couple of different ways that you have to think about how you're going to build a financial, whether it's, whether it's fractional financial services or fractional leadership services. So one of the big questions that you have to ask is, do you want a job or do you want a business or an entity that exists beyond you? And that's the first question that you really have to answer. And I have so many people that I work with that they do not want employees by under any circumstances it's a case of when they left corporate that was one of the biggest you know deep breaths that they took sigh of relief of i don't have to deal with managing people anymore and all the fun that comes along with that so but then on the other side there's also other ways now that you can scale your services through outsourcing and having 1099s, you can have independent contractors, offshore resources, virtual assistants. There are any number of ways to get work done that's all the stuff that you don't want to do. And it just allows you to focus on what it is that you do best. And to Mark's point, finding the work sometimes becomes, well, when you think about it, a lot of people, when you ask, why did you start doing what you're doing, whatever that career choice is, there's normally something there that's a, I'm good at it and I enjoy it. And you, you ask that question about the different tasks that you do and you want most of your time to be spent doing what you're good at and what you love doing. And then everything else you think of how you scale. And my recommendation is if you're, if you're the one that's hustling the work, 
and you're also responsible for project management, then my recommendation has always been about 25 to 30% of your time always needs to be allocated to business development. If there's an expectation of origination anywhere in your job description, then that's kind of the numbers that you're looking at is that 25 to 30%. And then what Mark has done incredibly well is he's created that network of referral relationships that consistently feed him the opportunities that he most wants to do, the type of projects, the companies, the industries, et cetera. And then he focuses on project management now. And, you know, then it's a matter of his, his tasks and his day looks, they just look different. And that's the thing that's fun about it. So what would you add to that, Mark? I would say everyone, when you first start out, it's about 95% of your time that you're selling. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny because you can know when, you, when somebody's new, when you're, and this was pre-COVID, of course, you'd go to every networking event and you'd see somebody. They'd be there for that first six months to a year. They're at everything, right? And then all of a sudden, you don't see them. And you finally get a hold of them and you go, what happened? He says, I sold so much, I'm too busy to go to anything, you know? So it's just a matter of time. My personal goal is about 50% of the time I'm working on clients, client management or projects, about 25% of my time I'm doing uh, uh, business uh, development, and about 25% of my time I'm just love to read about what I do and, and learn. So there's- and learning. It's the learning piece. So those, that's how I break up my week. Um, it sort of works out on average sometimes, but uh, uh, you know, there, there are weeks when I go, I didn't do anything but have fun talking to people and I have clients to take care of. I have to be very careful about that. Exactly, and you do need to make sure, the thing that you also have to do as you're expanding your practice, Mark brought up a really good point. I think one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make in creating a fractional service practice is they do just what Mark said, which is they, um, they network like mad and visit with everybody under the sun and then end up with all of these projects that all of a sudden they have zero time to do any relationship management and they don't have a foundation of relationships that are filling the funnel while they're doing the work. So Mark did, he's, he's one of, the reason I invited him today to have the conversation with us is he actually took off a period of time to work within a startup as a CEO. And during that time period, it's a case of he continued networking. And even though he was in a full-time gig, he still maintained relationships and he still created emotional equity within those relationships. So even if you get a gig or you've secured an opportunity that looks like a full-time job, but it's only a window in time, and recognize that the average tenure right now for a, I think it's a COO when I did my, I just looked this up here a couple months back, a COO is going to be engaged for about 20 months. And then you're going to be looking for something again. And a CMO is going to be engaged for around 24 months. And CEOs are less than five years. So then if you do the math that Mark shared, where it's for every $10,000 of income is a month that you're in career transition. If you make 200,000 a year, that's 20 months that it's going to take you to secure that next gig. So then if you have a leadership gig making 200 grand a year and it lasts for 20 months and then it takes you another 20 months to replace it, you're basically cut your salary in half and you've dealt with this whole thing of that stress of just trying to figure out what's coming next and fractional work I think can be the way to go and it totally alleviates that hysterical activity swing that you end up with and instead of chasing the monster deals step back and think about how do I chase a deal that's going to provide consistent cash flow for two years 
and I'll help the company accomplish some very specific objectives, but they're one of 10. So if I lose one, then that's okay because I've got more in the pipeline to back it up. So what would you add to that, Mark, from your perspective? Because I, I know you've seen the same thing happen over and over. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I don't know. I don't know how to respond. I'm sorry. I was thinking about something else. Uh, I told so, him I was going to be putting him on the spot with some you questions. Caught well, you caught well, me you on that one. Uh, I still I do it. believe, I, I believe, you know, if that this gig economy, which is basically, you know, a labor market, I'll just read this definition because people don't really understand it, but it's a, a labor market characterized by the prevalence of short term contracts or freelance work as opposed to permanent jobs. And that's what's happening. The, the millennials get credit for this, but it's really, it's really a benefit to people with more experience, um, you know, that are maybe baby boomers in their you know, 50s and 60s. Uh, not that you have to do that, but all that knowledge is in, in the fact that short-term engagements are the way things are going. So you take your passion, you go out, solve that problem, and then you, you learn from that, you get better, and you go and solve the next person's problem, but you stay again. I, I, you'll hear me say this too many times. Stay within your lane. Do what you really like to do. And that stay in your lane is so incredibly important because I see so many people that they do just what you said where they're balancing the checkbook and they're sitting back and they're thinking, well, it's not really what I want to do, but I can do it and I need to make money. Right. And, and, and you, it's easier to do as you build your relationships throughout the community and you know somebody that balances checkbooks. So you just take them, you know, or you partner with somebody that balances checkbooks and, you know, that they charge out at a third of what you do. And now when you do work, you make your rate. You know, and, and you're still selling somebody else's work and you're making friends and helping, whether it's, you know, systems in integration or design or reviews. You know, a CFO shouldn't be doing that, right? Mm -hmm. or, or a CEO shouldn't be doing that. They should be looking for the results and asking the questions and directing people. And how have you found your practice expanded when you did take that approach? of a specialist versus a generalist because that's really what you've done mm -hmm. yeah I, I think it, i think it's easier to sell one thing at a time right so if you if you start telling people all the things you can do they get lost in it mm -hmm. so for me for me it's easier to concentrate on that people all over the city know what i do now it's just not, it's not like, is he brokering or is he doing this or is he doing CFO services or is he doing that? No, everybody knows. And, and so I get calls and it's, it's amazing. Well, and it is the, and there are so many good things about what you have done in terms of um, just building the model around it. What percentage of your time, and this was actually a question that just came up, what percentage of your time do you find that you are performing like the strategy services versus coaching perhaps that junior employee that doesn't have your experience that was probably making, you know, they're the cut when they cut that senior guy's salary or senior gal salary and they hired somebody for 50% and they lost all that experience. How much of your time do you think you're going to be spending mentoring and coaching? And is that a potential service offering there also? Yeah, I think if if you're a good fractional consultant or in whatever area you're, you're you have to have a heart to teach and have to a time to to make sure you're doing well. We talked about this the other day. The difference between being an advisor and being a consultant, right? Yes. If you're if you're an advisor, you're at that C level. You're giving advice. You're asking questions. And you're and you're directing others to do those detailed jobs. If you're a mm -hmm. C-suite person, you're not supposed to be doing that, right? That's that's an advisor. Advisors get paid really well. Yes. 
consultants, if we get confused about this, they're the guys that say, oh, there's this project and I'm going to go into this company for three months and I'm going to be there every day and I'm going to fix this. Okay. That doesn't pay as well. It's, it'll pay well, but it doesn't pay. It's not C-suite work, right? So you have to decide what you want to do and what the value is of it. But again, I, I keep saying this, you know, do, you're going to do better if you stay with what you really like to do. And I do want to keep going back to that, the pricing question again, because I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with of how are they going to get paid to do this? And when you think about how you get paid to do this, and I'm just going to share a little bit of my perspective and then Mark, I'd love to hear your, your take on it as well. But um, I think what the biggest mistake is people look at it and they try to replace whatever their rate was. So if they made $50,000 a year doing something, then they want to make $25 an hour. And you don't do that. That's not the, you don't want to, you don't want to arrive at a pricing based on what it was divided by 2,080 hours in order to get to your billable rate. And I think what you need to think about and what Mark did is he went and evaluated what companies were paying for advisory services that solved a problem. So for example, um, a senior level sales manager is probably going to make somewhere in the neighborhood of anywhere from 150 to 350,000 a year and up. And it, that leaves you a whole lot of room in terms of figuring out a billing rate if you're going to do fractional sales leadership. So there's a component of what you're going to look at that is based on, well, if they're already spending X per hour, but they only need somebody for this much time, they're willing to pay a premium to have your expertise. And you need to factor in that value proposition that the client is going to experience based on having you. And that needs to be a part of it as well. And that's one of the reasons why fractional work can be so incredibly powerful because instead of you selling a package of hours for a month, what you're doing is you're selling access to a resource that can help the company accomplish something significant. And then it becomes a matter of, helping the company explore the sales process is different. So instead of you interviewing for a job, now it's a, what are you trying to accomplish? What have you done in the past to try to get it done? How did that work? How did it not work? What are the, what are the biggest constraints that you have on your internal team? One of our attendees made the point beforehand of, well, the companies are always saying we've hired somebody to do that. Well, yes, they are, and obviously they're not getting it done. Otherwise, you wouldn't be there. So you don't want to approach it as a, well, obviously you're not getting it done. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here because the business owners, you know, we sometimes get a little bit sensitive about when somebody starts poking at our sore spots and telling us the things that we haven't done well or the mistakes that we've made or expose poor judgment or leadership skills. So. You want to be tactful as you approach this, and that's where you can ask a lot of the questions around, where have you struggled with this? Where have you found components that are missing? What are your current people lacking? And one of the things that I encourage you to do is establish your rate menu of what different services are. So, for example, Mark has a valuation service that is a flat fee and it's probably a fee based on the complexity of the business so but it's a flat fee and that's an entry point that then leads in to other work <clears throat> and then the other work is probably billed out at other project rates and and that's time something to think about what would you add to that mark no time and material and you know i i think on top of all this discussion of rates, remember, don't be too cheap because yes. people expect you to be expensive if you are giving them good information. So it adds value. And so many people are thinking, well, I'll get more work if I do, you know, 
at 140 versus 180, for example, out per hour. And I'm going, take the 180, do less work. Well, and, and deliver you know, more it'll value. Be more, it'll be more interesting work, right? And these people appreciate you and are willing to pay you your rate at the top of that. So I really, I think if you start negotiating on rate and fees, uh, you've done something wrong earlier in the um, uh, the nurturing process of getting to know each other. Because I rarely well, have a problem with fees by the time I start a job. So. And that, that goes to how much time would you say that you spend actually exploring the client's opportunity to figure out if you're the right solution for them? Yeah, I mean, you've got to be, and, and, and you're gonna have to invest some time, learn about them, ask questions. You know, that 25% business development time is talking to people, trying to figure out how you're gonna help them, what they need, who in the community they might need to, to meet as well as your services, um, and just continue to bring value after value um, into, this or, into their organization. And, and, and price discussions never really come up. Well, and that's actually, so when you talk about the sales process, so much of it is actually based on really approaching it from the perspective of what does this client really need? And then you create a network of resources to address all of those peripheral needs. So the staying in the lane that's a nugget that, that Mark is sharing that is priceless to so many people. And I would encourage you to think about your, um, your discovery process and you do start to understand and discover exactly where you best fit and how to very quickly sift and sort through in one meeting. So this is the first meeting that you have with a prospect. It's discovery. It's where you understand what their challenges are, what their needs are, what they've done in the past, some of the constraints that they've had. That's all within that first conversation. And then from that, you can figure out whether or not there's a there there. Do you want to explore this further? Does it make sense? Does it not fit into what interests you and that you are going to be well compensated for? And then that's when, if it doesn't make sense for you, you refer someone that can solve that problem. And the thing is, is Mark has people that are looking for opportunities for him because they know that he will stay in his lane. And that if opportunity comes back up for what they do, he will bring the client back around to them in order to serve. So that's something else that when you're thinking about whether or not it makes sense to go broad with your services, or get very narrow and specific, it's better if you're specific and then you do what you love and then you refer everything else. And all of those other people refer you as well. Exactly right. So, okay. Go ahead, Mark. We had a, we had a question say, too. Yeah, I, it was amazing. I'm just, you know, Brendan mentioned I went to Startup World for a while. I came back mid-April or mid-August last year and in, just because of my network and and pe knowing people i was billing you know six grand a month it from zero in about mm, less than two or three weeks and it that's due so that is due mostly to the fact that while mark was in startup world he still maintained a lot of contact with his network he remained engaged with his referral partners and he continued to deliver emotional equity to those relationships. So the second he needed them, they were there in order to support him with launching back into his consulting practice. Okay, so there is a really good question here that I do wanna talk about from Tom. And it says, how does efficiency factor in? The more engagements I do, the more I can call on my previous gigs for IP, et cetera. Okay, so Tom, I think I'm going to see if I can actually unmute you because let's talk about this because I think that's something that's pretty important. 
And there we go. Well, you were unmuted. You're unmuted now, Tom. Okay. So tell me what you're thinking on that. Let's expand this a little bit more. Well, personally, I'm a startup, so I'm brand new to this whole consulting environment. Um, I brought with me from my previous employers a lot of tools and, and IP that I can apply to future engagements, but I'm quickly discovering that um, when you do something the first time with a, with a client, um, you don't have to rebuild that every time for future clients. So absolutely. While, while I'm looking at the time I'm spending on some of that IP development, um, it, it takes my hourly, you know, t uh, cost per hour down because it takes me longer to do it. So therefore the next one I do, I'm going to, you know, cut and paste. I'm going to change the names and reuse a lot of that material so that it's not like a brand new um, piece of work. Yes. Does that remember, happen in the, go ahead. Well, remember that your fee for getting paid should not be based on the actual time and material spent, but should be significantly attached to the value received by the client for the project. Okay. So when you're selling retained services, that's one of the biggest that you think about. So let me give you a really quick example. One of my other clients is an attorney that his area of expertise is helping companies pursue their financing if they're going to pursue either venture capital or series A or series B. And his, his area of expertise, I mean, he has done so many of the memos and the contracts and all of that due diligence in the beginning that literally it takes him and because he's built all the contracts already it takes him about fifteen hundred dollars worth of his time to do it if he's billing it out per hour but the company if they were going to buy this from one of the big law firms in town or he works with a lot of companies that are of course in silicon valley if he's going to serve them, they're used to paying 150 to 400,000 for those same services. And it takes him $1,500 worth of time. So what he has done is he's created a package and it's based on the fact that he likes serving companies in the Midwest that don't have big budgets, but, and the average, the average, um, the average um, funding is probably going to be in the half million to $1 million range. So he backed into it, had several conversations with those startups about what would you spend, what makes sense, what can you spend? And because the thing is, is he didn't want to create a threshold that made it hard for him to do the work that he loved to do. And he arrived at a number that's $15,000. And he's being paid very well to do something that he can do like that. Literally, he can turn that work around in just a matter of hours, but he's still getting very well compensated for it. So think about that, Tom, when you're thinking about that whole efficiency, yes, you're building a lot of tools and things that are going to enable you to do the work faster. And in the beginning, you may be a little bit upside down, but you're going to right size very quickly the more of those projects you get underway. And then you're going to have that threshold, though. And then your efficiencies just deliver increased profitability. Does that help? I hope. And, and I would add, uh, you know, yes, you're getting paid 300 bucks an hour or $200 an hour or whatever. That presumes you're using these tools. So if you have to invest some of your personal development time, like you said, you know, it's intellectual property and ability. You, you need to look at the end and always send out a bill that you can feel good about and not be pushing in a bunch of uh, training time if you're charge, charging, um, you know, high expertise level fees. So it's not unusual for me to get off on a squirrel path and have to write off hours on a client. Well, but, and then this is where, so my recommendation on that is you will end up with scope creep. And it's just the nature of you get in there. And one of my favorite things to do when I do see scope creep happening with fractional services 
is that's when I immediately step back and say, this is not what I love doing. And if it's not what I love doing and I'm not really going to get paid for it, I need to go find somebody that does love doing it and that has a reasonable rate that they can charge. And then I'm going to immediately refer them in there. And I'm going to have that conversation that says, you need this done. And I have an expert that can help you with getting this done. And then you introduce the expert. And of course, the client's always going to say, well, I didn't budget for it. Well, you know, you we kind of know that whenever you start doing something, you're going to open a can of worms, no matter where you go. And it's trying to put everything back into the can where sometimes you experience a few challenges. But that's one of my recommendations that I make as far as that scope creep thing. The other thing is um, you do create that menu of services that if there is a training option, and I always recommend that you think about what that training option would look like. Because if you go in and do consulting, there will always be work at the top, but then there's also going to be time spent with the people who are on the line doing the work. And then you think about, do you want to do that training? Is that something that excites you? Or is that an opportunity for you to add a resource that you then subcontract? And then you make a markup on it. So that's the thing is you very quickly, when you're thinking about fractional services, the more you can think about the work that you do that is strategic and that delivers the most value and has the highest benefit to the client, and then all the other stuff you refer and bring in the appropriate resources, and then you receive compensation also for those as well. And then that's where you create revenue streams independent of selling your time. That's the thing that you've got to be really careful about with the fractional model is you do want to make sure that you don't fall into the, the time for money trap. That means you just have created another job and mm -hmm. you're always going to be hustling your next deal. So you want to step back from that and think about it like your fractional service business now becomes here's a product offering. Here's a training solution. Here's a consulting solution. Here's project management, whatever that looks like. And then these are my resource partners that I engage. So, okay, so we are right at 1130. So let's very quickly see what other questions that we have along these same lines. And then I wanna get everything wrapped up for you all that you, I want you to walk away with a, this is what I'm gonna take action based on today. So let me ask the folks that I have on the call right now, I would like to ask, have you thought about what your service offering will be? And has this conversation helped you with kind of imagining what that product of you is going to look like? Because that's, I think, one of the biggest questions that you have to answer. And then how are you going to get paid for it? Do you see a path to that? Exactly. And, and, you know, there's multiple ways to get involved in this fractional work. Okay. I mean, you can go to work for a, a placement agency and they'll sell jobs and, and treat you as an employee and you'll go out. Or you can join a, a, a current um, consulting or fractional group, you know, and all I do is make sure you understand the fees and what both sides of those expectations. And I would shop around. There's plenty of them popping up for some reason this must work right and then the third way which i think is what uh brenda and i are are talking about here is you, you're on your own or you get together with a small group of friends and you put together a small group well how do you do that and what does that look like and 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 we're just really doing a very high level introductory here of what's going on but because we see this huge demand for or uh, to understand all the steps of just getting into the fractional business, uh, Brendan's putting together a, a training uh, opportunity uh, in the next, coming soon, right? Well, and it's actually something that Mark and I are collaborating on. So he's giving me a lot of the credit, but my best teachers are my clients. So I have a host of Mark Blackton's, not, not quite as special as Mark, that are actually, 
working with me or I have interviewed them extensively to discover what they've done well and highlighted their steps that they've taken to success and then broken it down into how do you view this as a business? And that is something that he and I are working on. If y'all have interest, we'd love to chat with you about it. Um, it's probably something that's going to be a training session that helps you examine the business of fractional services and what that would look like for you and your business. So, okay. Now, one of the things we have another question here. Actually, it's more the perspectives. Okay. So Larry, if you can stick around, cause I wanna chat with you a little bit about what your question was. So I do want to I, I do want to dig into that, and we're gonna I do want to wrap up our recording though today, and just give a really quick summary of what our highlights were, so that you've got takeaways based on what we've talked about today. So and Mark, you tell me what I am missing in terms of the summary. So first of all, we encourage you to view fractional work as a first option rather than a last resort. You can replace and exceed what your compensation was probably in your corporate gig, and you can do the work that you absolutely love doing. You do have to be intentional about identifying what that work is and stay in your lane, which means you will need to find other resources that do all the periphery services, but those added resources actually create revenue opportunities for you or product offerings beyond you. And the key, I think, to being successful with a fractional model is expanding quickly beyond that product of your time to where there is a product of you that people purchase and are able to use repetitively in their business. The other thing is, this is not something that you're going to want to do on your own. You will need to network and establish that base of relationships that supports you with accomplishing whatever that goal is for the type of project you wanna do. So you have to find the financial advisors and the bankers and the executive coaches and leaders that are hearing of that individual project work and then that opens the door for you. The other thing that we did not dig into today, but it is a further conversation, is that buyer journey, what the path needs to be to onboarding the client. We do also have another recording that Chris Motley and I did that really dives into creating that fractional model. And I will include that recording link with this one when I send out the link on Monday because you will be receiving the recording link for the session today. And I'll share that one with you, as well as a couple of other tips on creating that product that you can sell that's independent of time and materials. So, okay, what else did I, did I miss on that summary, Mark? I think, I think you did a really good job. <clears throat> I think, you know, again, define what you'd love and, and figure out what the market is for it. Um, <clears throat> decide how you might want, start investigating how you might want to get involved in fractional work. Is it with an agency or on your own? Um, and then once you sort of, you know, you're, you're out there shopping for partners, basically. And then once you figure out what you want to do and how you want to do it, even before you dive in, maybe it's a side hustle, right? Start promoting yourself seeing if you're good at selling this, you know, you might find that your side hustle becomes bigger than your uh, full-time hustle in a very, very short period of time. Absolutely. And one of the things, so Mark, you are one of the area leaders within an organization called FANG, aren't you? The Financial Can Executives Networking Group, right? So this is a group of, that helps people transition between jobs in the financial service or financial executive level type people, controllers, CFOs and whatnot. Love to meet those folks and help them. We coach each other, we support each other. We talked earlier that it can be 12 months to two years to find a job at the, at the executive level. And so uh, uh, there are, I, I believe there's probably groups out there for, you know, for marketing and whatnot, but find a group of people that'll support you in between Jobs. We like to say when you're working, you're just in between searches, you know, so 
uh, it's a great group and um, I'm re very proud to be part of it. Absolutely. Okay, so I will also include the link to Fang in the um, summary email that I send out on Monday. So make sure you stay tuned for that. If you have not received emails from me before, you might check your spam folder. I will be, if you, if you haven't received an email from me before, you'll be receiving a welcome message that talks a little bit about what the programming that we're doing here is and it invites you to continue to hear about what we've got coming up. And I do send out a weekly email that includes just a prospecting tip, a way to think about your business a little bit differently in terms of securing and finding your next opportunity. And then um, it also includes the summary and invitation to whatever our next session is going to be. Because we offer these on a weekly basis and the topic is all about the pivot. And it's that, are you pivoting in your life or in your career or in your business? And I think just about everybody has faced just a little bit of a pivot over the past year and a half. So I'm gonna wrap things up with a thank you to Mark for sharing your expertise and being willing to be candid about your own personal experience in exploring fractional and what your lessons learned were from that. Know that this will be a continuing conversation that Mark and I have, and we're also going to be expanding and bringing in a few other folks to hear other perspectives as well. But gonna wrap things up, say stay tuned. Also, if you have not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do so, so that you stay in touch with us for future episodes. So I'm gonna wrap us up with a thank you very much and remember to get what you want. You must help others get what they want. Have a great day and good selling. Thank you.